Hi, I'm Dan Lakin of Bar Events UK. Usually we supply giant teepees, mobile bars, and event staff. Welcome to Around the World in 80 Drinks. This week we're making the mojito, and we're also gonna be joined by a special guest back in the UK. We're taking a pit stop back to the UK. Because, let's face it, we've been around the world already, and we've heard great things about things that are happening around the world. I want to bring it back for a week, and then we'll go off again. So, let's, uh, let's, let's, uh, if you're gonna introduce people to this, then make sure you hashtag around the world in 80 drinks. And also, if you're gonna hashtag someone, make sure you tag someone to tell that they're in, um, that they're into a competition, you're into a competition. Sorry, I had, I had two lots of music in my ears and oh, my brain was farting. Um, so yeah, please, sorry. Tag someone that might want to watch this and hashtag Around the World and 80 Drinks. If you're watching on playback, hashtag Around the World and 80 Drinks. Again, tag someone and you'll be able to into a competition to win free cocktails. Last week's winner is Maddie Maddie. Well done. You tagged quite a few people, so you were entered over and over. Your name was drawn out of a hat and you won. So you've won free cocktails. So please send us your address, or we'll tag you in this after, just in case you're not watching. Send us your address, and uh, and we'll send you some free cocktails. Simple as that. Tag someone who you think would like to watch this show. Simple as that. Tell them why, and hashtag around the world in 80 drinks. If you're watching on playback, hashtag around the world in 80 drinks, and tag someone. Easy peasy. Right, okay, so we're making the mojito. Um, want to expand on the mojito, want to tell you why it's made like it is, or why you should make it like it is, whether it's at home or in a bar. So, you're going to need some ingredients. If you followed us on Facebook on the events page, you'll see the ingredients that you might be making along already. So, as a recap to, the, to you guys and for anyone else who isn't watching, I'm using Mount Gay Rum. I put it in this cam so you can see. It's a golden rum. It's a fantastic rum. You can use a white rum or a golden rum. It's absolutely fine either way. Um, the original mojito, or the recorded mojito, shall we say, was Bacardi. Uh, more to come on that. I'll elaborate on that later. I'm using lime. So this lime is Funkin' Lime. I mean, it is better, to be fair, to use fresh produce, um, but for ease, and I've got it in the house, I'm gonna use this. And let's face it, making cocktails at home is about ease. Do you want to have to juice a whole lime every time you make a mojito or another drink? Probably not. So buy some of this on Amazon or souschef.com. Easy, it's less than a tenner. You just pour 25 mil, away you go. I'm also using, it's golden granulated sugar. If I'm honest, if you're gonna go out and buy some sugar for mojitos, buy light muscovado. Light muscovado is the best sugar to use in a cocktail like this. The difference being, A, the taste, light muscovado is a bit more woody, a bit more, you know, it's, it's a golden sugar, so you can imagine the taste of a golden sugar compared to the white sugar. I'm sure you know the difference when you put white sugar in tea and gold sugar, or the demerara in coffee, whatever. But the difference also is the grain of the sugar. So. Um, a muscovado sugar is really fine, finer than sand. It's like flour almost. If you put it in your hands, it like it will drip through your hands like a like a glue or or something you know really gloopy, really like flour, not not like a sand. So that means when you put it in a drink and you stir it, it's going to dissolve quicker. If you're going to use a like a, a, you know a golden granulated sugar or a normal granulated sugar or a caster sugar, it's it's a little less fine. It's going to take longer to dissolve. That's all it is. But if you can find a golden sugar, perfect. That's what I'd use, especially if you're using a golden rum. 
And finally, to make a classic mojito, you put soda water in it. Done, easy. Or sparkling water, whatever, same thing. So, let's get underway. You're gonna need a tall glass, uh, and as I've mentioned in previous weeks, when I say tall, it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be, you know, really tall physically. It's about volume. So, if you go to a bar and you get something in a tall glass, it's generally about 12 ounces. Um, so, 250 mils, something like that, around that sort of mark. And we're gonna start with the same base that we do every week. We're gonna start with our sweet and sour. So, our sour is 25 mil of uh, lime juice. If you're using a whole fruit, then, or sorry, fresh fruit, then use the whole fruit. So if you're using a whole lime or fresh lime, use the whole lime. So a lime like this, I'll just place it here in case it shows on the other cam. It's, it's fairly big lime, but if you squeeze that whole thing, you can either cut it up into eights and squeeze it all in segments and chuck it all in, then you've got whole lime in there. It's still gonna to equate to about 25 mil. And if it doesn't, if it's a bit more, it doesn't matter. You can taste it, you can add more sugar if it's too sour. If it's smaller and, there's, and you've got too much sugar in there, then get another lime, get another segment and put that in, add a bit more sour. So you can balance it later. But essentially, you wanna start with about 25 mil and that's in there. So I'm not using sugar syrup and most of you guys at home probably aren't. Hopefully using some sort of a caster sugar or you know golden sugar anyway. Half a shot. I always say one shot of sour to half a shot of sweet. Half a shot of sweet sweet equates to about two table sorry two teaspoons of sugar. So I'm using a bar spoon, a bar spoon and a teaspoon in volume are the same measurement. Should be about five mil. So. Just give that a quick stir, let that sugar start dissolving. Give it an opportunity to, you know, release its sweetness. Next up, I'm gonna stick my rum in. So whatever rum you're using, get a whole large measure in. I've worked with tons of bartenders over the year, and I've, uh, I've trained bartenders, and I've been trained myself, obviously, from somewhere, and I've been trained by loads of different bar managers. I'm using techniques that I've learned over you know, loads of years and I'm using techniques that some have taught me and I'm also using techniques that I've learned not to use, if that makes sense. So it, a lot of bartenders might say, oh, make a paste in the bottom with your sugar and, and your, your, your sour and make a paste, make that make it into a thick paste and when you add your room then it can come through the room. Well, the one thing about a paste, like wallpaper paste, it fucking sticks. Sorry for swearing. So if it's gonna to stick to the bottom of the glass, that's no use. When you put your mint in, your mint then sticks to the bottom of the glass, you're not gonna taste anything. So please don't make, don't make a paste. Just chuck all your stuff in and stir it. That's all you wanna do. Get it all in there. The longer all the ingredients are together, the more they combine, the more, the more easily the, the sugar's gonna dissolve. Right, next up, mint. We wanna get this in really quickly. So all we're doing is getting all the flavors in there as quickly as possible. Especially when you're on a bar, like when I used to bartend back in my day, these, these are the biggest drinks, the fastest, the, sorry, the biggest selling drinks over the bar. So we used to have to make these like crazy, but also make them taste good. And the key to a mojito is actually take time over it. Allow the mint flavor to come out. So the quicker you get the ingredients in, the better. If you're using packaged mint from a supermarket like I am, and most people are probably using that, the mint leaves at the moment are really, really small, you know, not necessarily great quality. If you've bought from a fruit and veg shop, then I can guarantee you're gonna have a big bunch. It's gonna be a lot, a lot better than mint. So these small supermarket mint leaves, I'm putting about 10 to 15 of those in. And actually, I'll teach you a trick. You, I guarantee everyone's, well, pretty much everyone's ordered a, uh, a mojito in a bar. And you'll see a bartender with one of these muddlers, and then they'll start smashing this mint, and they'll smash all the sugar together. They're trying to smash, the sugar into dissolving. Well, the sugar doesn't dissolve by smashing it. And they're trying to get the flavor out of the mint by smashing it. Let me teach you a trick, bartenders and people at home. Get this mint leaf, put it on your tongue. To me, that tastes of mint. I haven't smashed it yet. Now chew it. Oh, every time. Absolutely vile, really bitter. So when you're smashing the mint into a mojito, you're getting, you're breaking all these little vines, all these little veins on the back of the leaf. And all that bitterness is going into your drink, which is not gonna make a good mojito. It tastes more like toothpaste or, or mouthwash. What you want is just a really fresh mint taste. So get your mint in there and stir it. That's all you wanna do. 
I mean, the mint's been in there for a matter of 30 seconds. This is already taste of mint. You know how easily that mint went onto your, onto your tongue, how, how easily that flavour came out when it was on your tongue. That's all you want to do. Just tickle it round the glass. Don't smash it. Don't break any veins on the back of the mint. Just do this. All you're really actually doing, because the, the flavour's going to come out of the mint, is dissolving that sugar. That's all you're doing. Right, next thing. Because that's essentially this drink finished. Get some ice in. Get it in quick. Don't fill it to the top and stir. All you're doing now is cooling the drink. You're still getting the flavour out of the mint. You're still maybe dissolving that sugar. But let's face it, if that sugar hasn't already dissolved, it's now going to struggle because it's getting a lot colder. It's going to struggle to dissolve in, in a cold liquid. So, keep on stirring. You can see that ice is reduced. That means the drink's diluted. That means the drink's got longer, which is what we want, because at the moment all it is is essentially rum and uh, lime juice. Get some, more, get some more ice in there. Stir. Now classically, I say classically, if you order this in a bar, it would be crushed ice. Crushed ice is not ideal to order at home, or sorry, to, uh, to use at home. So just use cubes. Uh, I think the original Bacardi Mojito in first, first, uh, let me start again. The first recorded Mojito was a Bacardi Mojito, made with Bacardi. It was made with Bacardi and cubed ice. That said, when you go to a bar, they might not use Bacardi and they'll probably use crushed ice. Neither is right or wrong, let's face it, this drink probably existed in the 1600s, maybe even 1700s. Probably wasn't called a mojito, but I can guarantee back then when they made room, they probably put lime, sugar and mint in it. Do your research. There's, again, there's no right or wrong to this, to this drink. There's no classified uh, origin of this drink, other than the fact it's Cuban. So, get ice all the way to the top if you can. I've pretty much used all my ice. Give it one last stir, the mint's through the drink, the rum's through the drink, the sugar and the lime. Have you got a straw? I might have a straw down here. In one of these disco boxes. Nice paper straw, ethical. Now, garnish it with what's in the drink. Mint. So you get a nice big sprig, pop it down the sides. By the way, the drink isn't finished yet, but I am garnishing it. Let me teach you that in a sec. Oh, I've already pre-cut a lime here, so I'm going to pop a lime next to the straw, pop a mint spring next to the straw. Now, classically, or not even classically, a mojito is soda water topped. That's what it is. If it hasn't got soda water on the top, it's not a mojito. I don't like soda water. I don't like watering my drink down too much. What I do like is ginger beer. Ginger beer and rum are like a match made in heaven. So, I'm going to pop a bit of ginger beer in mine. I appreciate this was on the ingredients list, but let's face it, I'm teaching you to make a mojito, not something that I like to drink. So, that said, we can make this mojito into loads of different things. Your classic mojito is topped with soda water. I've topped mine with ginger beer. Don't top it with ginger beer or soda water, stick some Prosecco in. Then we're getting on to supercharged posh mojitos. You know, put some raspberries in the bottom and muddle it before you put the mint in. You get some raspberry flavor in there. Put some strawberries in the bottom, muddle them before you put the mint in. Some strawberry flavor in there. Top it with Prosecco again, or top it with soda water, or top it with ginger beer, anything. You can really, really, really go to town on mojitos. You can use different rums, different fruits, different toppings, and then you can, you know, you can make loads of drinks just by learning one, and that is a mojito. Cheers. I feel like I flew through that. I hope everyone caught up. If not, you can you can actually you have the bonus of rewinding back, whereas when I make a mistake, I don't have that bonus. So now we're coming up to the next part of the show. Are we ready? Okay. So next up, we have a guest, as I mentioned before, local to us in the UK. We thought, as I mentioned before that we have travelled around the world and we have had really positive things from you know South Korea who are back open and Oregon who are you know doing all these fancy things with uh, testing and, and vaccinating and this sort of thing and at the moment the news in the UK is a little bit negative and it is a little bit you know will we open on the 4th of July won't we this that and the other so I thought let's come back to the UK let's have a pit stop with a bar owner that I know is positive and is absolutely they have actually been nailing this this shutdown thing. So, please welcome the award-winning restaurant owner and chef, 
Matt Broadley. Hiya, how are you doing? I'm good, mate. How are you? All right, all right. We're all right. How's how's it going in uh, in Ilkley? How's life in lockdown? All right, it's, it's different, but um, we're we're smashing it out a little bit. So. Yeah, I mean that's that's one of the reasons I want to talk to you. Actually, there's been a lot of negative press, um, and and you know there's always a lot of negativity in the news saying how restaurants are going to struggle to reopen and restaurants are taking a massive hit during this coronavirus thing. Um, but you, especially on Instagram and Facebook, seem to be absolutely storming it ever since the start of all this. You know, tell us a bit about how you changed your business to to suit with well, the current situation. Yeah, well, we uh, we knew. Well, we, we thought lockdown was coming, so we just thought I'll just have a bit of a brainstorm to see um, what we could what we could do rather than just shut our doors because I knew we could still do uh, takeaways and stuff like that. So I thought we'd um, we do some nice fish and chips, apparently. Um, so I thought, why not? And turn it into a drive-through. Ilk, well, Ilkley's first drive-through fish and chip shop, um, as well as doing a corner shop and uh, frozen ready meal selection. So we like turned the business into three sort of like mini businesses but yeah it's, uh, and uh it's a, so you obviously changed it's pretty much overnight really wasn't it i mean that first week of lockdown weren't you serving fish and chips within you know seven to 14 days or something yeah we, we uh we we uh it was it a monday monday or tuesday at lockdown on that thursday i started doing the drive through um and we did 60 the first night um uh, Friday and Saturday we did 80, a week after, um, Thursday went up to 100, Friday went up to 150. We were doing, on the first Friday and Saturday, about just short or just over, we, around average 400 fish and chips. God, absolutely so insane. <laughs> it, is, it is mad because normally the bistro is not geared up for um, fishing, like a fish and chip shop, you know, we only got... Uh, relatively small fryers so we, we, we don't do a lot of frying it's pretty small uh, bistro kind of style food but um, yeah it's uh, it were it were tough one in the kitchen and one out front so yeah it's uh, and it was all telephone orders click and collect yeah, sort of service yeah, yeah be, people ring up and uh, book a time slot uh, tell us what car they're in they just pull up we'd have to get out of the car contact us through the car window through the glass and I just pop them in the boot and off they go. Absolutely amazing. And actually, that's why I saw you were storming it on Facebook and Instagram, because you were doing it in fancy <laughs> dress, weren't you? Yeah, we dre We got some of, some of the staff to dress up as a dinosaur or <laughs> a pope or something like that, you know. <laughs> Keep it light. I like it. I like it. So, and also your, your corner shop and... Uh, and your, your food delivery service. Did, were you delivering food as well, frozen meals, did you say, or was that click and collect? Yeah, because um, a lot of the old, old uh, our older customers uh, weren't allowed to come out for 12 weeks, so they, they were struggling to get orders from Tesco's, you know, the, the wait for Tesco's deliveries or whoever, it's, it was days, days, days. So they just emailed us their orders through. We use our suppliers to, bring the food on certain days here we just pick it all back here and then off, off we drop amazing delivering it so yeah and then get back for fish and chips <laughs> and then actually you mentioned in suppliers then i mean back in the early days of lockdown there was you no know, toilet roll in, in the supermarkets the fruit and veg was low like you had to go shopping and buy what was there and not what you wanted but I guess because all the restaurants and bars are closed down, your suppliers, I guess, were fairly well stocked, were they? I mean, how did it, yeah, how we, did you manage to get everything? We could get it all. We didn't. We didn't have any problems at all. Um, yeah. And selling the uh, selling the job lot. Flour. I mean, everyone's all of a sudden started baking, didn't they? So the country ran out of flour. Well, in the supermarkets anyway. But yeah, we could still get it and. Uh, Vlog it on, people making bread. We were giving recipes out and stuff. And... So, yeah. Amazing. Awesome. I know you used to use a local fish supplier. Um, how do you go about making, get, or oh, sorry, getting all your fish now? Because you obviously go through quite a lot of it. 
you know, my, well, my, my fish supplier was in uh, Manchester. Um, well, they, they completely shut down their market. Um, so I ended up having to go to a not so local um, supplier in Newcastle. Right, okay. Uh, so yeah, they they can they can they can, they, they, they can deliver because they had to stay open for the care homes and stuff like that. But everywhere else was was closed. But you 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 still getting it all all right? Oh yeah, we, yeah. Good, yeah, good. No problem at all. Something about uh, Broadleaf's restaurant and why I wanted to get him on in particular is it's absolutely awesome. Um, you know, a lot of people watching this have probably never been or maybe not have heard of it. Um, but there's certain things I always look for in a restaurant when, when I, whenever I go in, and that is, it, is it good food? Is there generally good drinks? Um, are the staff good? Is the atmosphere good? And the wine menu? Um, you can, I think you can tell a good restaurant by its house wine. And Matt at Broadleys absolutely nails all those things. Like, just tell us, tell us about it. Like, where where did you get your inspiration from? Where did you get the idea to even start a restaurant? And how do you consistently smash it all? I don't know. It's, we've, we've been, I've been planning it. Well, I've always wanted to be a bistro for, for quite a number of years. When you're working for the people, you like fire on seventy percent of what you need for what, well, what you do. Because the thirty percent, you know, I'm, I was saving, so I didn't get me home. So the ideas we've picked up along the way, where we've been um, do a bit of travelling, go down to London, market research, because they're way ahead of the game down there, as far as Manchester. Um, and yes, carefully pick members of staff who you know they've, they've worked with me before. Um, so they, most of the staff, approached us. The, it's sense of humour, we have a laugh, but we also get the job done. It's not, you know, we're just dead chilled and relaxed, and what have you. Just get some, uh, yeah, just get some comfy tunes on while you're prepping up and that, and just, just have a laugh with them and stuff like that. You've just got to look after yourself, and your staff will look after you. Yeah, 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 definitely. No, I ain't it. it's all on furlough. <laughs> <laughs> I guess uh, I guess your personality, Matt, though, says a lot about your restaurant. Um, you obviously love food, so you're banging out amazing dishes. You don't mind the odd drink or tipple here and there. I went on a stag do with Matt, and I can I can vouch for that. Um, and also, like you say, you you do have a laugh, so you, that is a key to keeping a good team. So I guess it just all boils down from the top with you. Yeah, yeah, it's just just whatever it is. I mean, oh, oh, yeah, we're gonna wear. I'm going to wear my mask tonight, but I think it's it's not the right mask I should be wearing tonight. But... <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to know how he started this call <laughs> earlier. <laughs> and um, and I also mentioned wines. I think you can tell a good restaurant by its wine menu, and in particular its house wine. I've been to loads of restaurants where the food's absolutely amazing, the service is spot on, and then you try the house wine, or you try even the next few up, and they're just not... It's just not something you'd want to drink with, you know, a fifteen-pound dish, for example. I mean, how how do you get your help there? Because obviously, you're not a you're not a connoisseur of wines. What? How do you how do you do that? Um, well, we, we work closely with Martinez, um, local wine shop. You know, because we've got no storage space here whatsoever. So when the wine comes in, it's straight in the fridges, it's straight in the wine rack, all on the rack behind me. We don't have a cellar or anything like that. Um, and we look at the we look at the wine. So we change it uh, with seasons, with um, fresh fruit coming in throughout the, throughout the year. So we like to try and do a, a few wines which work well with the food that we're doing. Uh, we, we keep certain wines on all the time because I mean our housework, you know, it's, it's stunning. It's it's a good it's a good balance with it, uh, reasonably priced, and yeah, you can it's very very comfortable. Absolutely. Um, but we also do wine nights, maybe do five or six a year. Um, this is a, a wine themed evening where you, um, it's price depending what, what sort of wine it is. We have a Chateau Moussa one once a year. Uh, these, these sell out really quickly as soon as we put them, uh, put them online and stuff like that. So. And then, nice. Like Master Wine comes around and talks about it. The wines, how they produce, the vineyards, the temperatures, the soils that they grow in, all that sort of jazz. Interesting, and then we serve food accompanied with the wine that they've chosen, with the menu that he's, he, he's given us to do. So, 
Amazing. I guess that's the bonus to being an independent. You know, you want to make a change. You want to do any sort of night. You've got your, you know, a chat oh, yeah. with yourself and maybe your wine supplier and away you go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we do all sorts. There's always something going on, whether it's live music Sundays or, um, what else do we do? Wine nights. Oh, I know. I know something you can do. Yeah, it's from your uh, from your Facebook. You get mass um... magicians in. We we do all yeah, just whatever. We're gonna have, and also, uh, you get guest have... chefs. Sorry. You you've had guest chefs in the past, haven't you? Yeah, um, she's been on. The, we got Rebecca, and she was on master, uh, finalist on Master Chef last year. So we got her, and we did um, a two course luncheon as a uh, ladies and gentlemen, and she. We did cook the food that she did on the show. She was in the kitchen helping, and then she'd come out and, and talk about the journey on the show and behind the scenes and stuff like that. And yeah, great. very popular. Uh, nice. We had some about four of the days throughout the year booked in with her as well, but obviously they've uh, been cancelled. But uh, we'll be back up and running with them when we, when we know. Yeah, no, that sounds really good. I'd like to come along to that, but. Uh, yeah, they're good. It wasn't to, want to be at the time. So, also, also planning ahead. Um, how how do you see July the fourth going? That's when the bars and restaurants are allowed to reopen. Um, at the moment, there's two meter distancing. Is it is it, is it even feasible for you to open a bistro like that size? Um, well, we, two meters. I think if it's two meters, I can get four tables in the bistro as opposed to thirteen that we've got. If it goes down to a meter, <clears throat> yeah, we stand a, a pretty good chance of uh, running about sixty percent. We have got outside, but that's where the dependent, so we can have a few come up. We've got about 30 covers outside, which we can do. Um, but we get the phones just ringing all the time, so we come up at the table for the fourth, and we book the table for the fifth, you know, these but I'm just, I just can't take any bookings until we know exactly what's going on next week, yeah. sort of thing, so. Um, yeah. We'll just sit and see what the guidelines are. So I guess you're pretty much just ready to roll. Yeah, I mean, other than that, we've got 13 tables inside. We've got 10 tables outside. You know, I'm, I'm not thinking about just going to the um, car parking meter and buying and buying all day tickets and just sticking tables down. <laughs> it, it, might, it might work. You never know. I like that. <laughs> I like that idea. Don't the council or think like, but there you go. <laughs> That's a great idea. So, and also when you when you do, um, you know, potentially reopen back as the bistro, are you going to keep the fish and chips up? Yeah, we'll keep the uh, drive-through going. To, we've got uh, regular customers and, who uh, have been asking this as well. So, yeah, absolutely. You know, if we can generate another line of revenue that we didn't do before, which might just top up the, top up the loss of the tables that we're going to be having. So, yeah, we'll just, we'll just see what happens. Yeah, I guess that's uh, it's making it affordable for everyone, isn't it? So that's I guess it. If we're not we're not going to be increasing prices or anything like that. Um, we just we just keep it real as we as we do, but we just, we'll just try a little bit harder and try and get our revenue elsewhere. Yeah, um, from the same kitchen building sort of thing. And I guess again, re relating back to the independent, it's uh, the benefit of being if you and, and Kerry being the boss. It's like you have a discussion and you get stuff done. There's no. There's no directors to go through, there's oh, no, no area managers, there's no... Yeah, we just if we want to do it, we just do it. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> if we want to drill, yeah, if we want to drill an hole, we'll just drill one. <laughs> we're not going to put anything in it, we'll just drill it. That's what we can. <laughs> oh dear. The, the bonus of being your own boss. Yeah. I hate drill. So, realistically, on July 4th, what do you reckon is going to happen? Um. I think there won't be any inside dining. I, I don't. I, well, if it is, it's a bonus. We're going to get ready for it anyway, but I just think it'll be outside with distancing. Um, but it will <clears throat> we'll definitely be open if the uh, weather depends. Well, it will, will be open. With, it's under cover anyway, part of it outside. So if it's, if it's warm, you know, we have people sitting out there when it's absolutely hammering it down. Um, so yeah, we can still serve outside. So yeah, why not? Yeah, and actually, um, I mean, at the time of filming, what's the date today? Twenty to the sixth. We're at two meter social distancing. Do you see that dropping in 
Do you see that dropping next week, or do you see it dropping in line with the 4th of July, or what do you reckon? I don't know. I'm just, I've got no idea. So um, you're, just, you're just going along I'm with the news like with, everyone else? Yeah. Um, I think there's a, a lot of talk about it easing off and, you know, the, the case of dropping and stuff like that. So it, it, does, it does look in further that it will, it will come down a little bit. So yeah. we'll see. But yeah, hopefully. Well, look, Matt, like I said before, the reason I wanted to get you on is because you did so well at open or changing your whole business from a bistro to a takeaway and obviously gearing back up for reopening doesn't seem to phase you in the slightest. So that's why I wanted to get you on. Um, thanks a lot for coming along. I just want to say, ladies and gentlemen, Matt Broadley, thank you. We'll post the links to Matt and Broadley's Bistro in the comments. We actually pre-recorded that about an hour or two ago because at the moment Matt will be knee deep in grease serving God knows how many fish and chips. So thanks a lot to Matt for sorting that out for us. We've got loads of exciting guests in, in the pipeline potentially lined up. When I say I'm going to re release the drinks and the guests on Monday, that's because I don't know who they are yet. <laughs> Honestly, next week I've got talks with Hong Kong, Indonesia, Poland, Russia, uh, Colorado. There's, there's so many people who are really keen to join us on this, on this show. So please, on Monday, check out who, what we're going to be making next week. And if I've sorted it out by then, also the guess it's going to be on next week. Don't forget, if you're watching, please tag someone who might like this show. Help us get this show out there. Please help us. If you're watching, please tag someone. I can't ask for anything else. If you do, we'll enter you into a competition to ring, win free drinks. Just tap -de tap tap and tag someone, please. If you're watching on playback, hashtag cocktails every day and tag, tag someone. You'll be helping me. That's all I ask for. For these live shows, free live shows, please just tag someone. That's all I ask. And we'll send you some free drinks if you win the competition. Simple as that. Simple as that. Hashtag 80, uh, sorry, around the world in 80 drinks. Thanks. I'm Dan Lakin, and you've been watching Around the World in 80 Drinks. I'm done.